curiosity, compassion, creativity. Curiosity is fairly straightforward as an idea to get across, don't you think? I mean, yeah, it makes you think deeply, but the concept is graspable. Graspable, is that even a word? Compassion is a bit more difficult because the word has been worn smooth, diminished. But creativity, there is nothing straightforward about it. And that's the essential point. You don't know or do creativity. You don't grasp it. Creativity grasps you if you're brave enough to let it. And eventually, you learn to dance with it. It's like hugging a tiger. I mean, the experience is powerful and transformative, but it's a precarious happening. There are no guarantees. It's also difficult to treat these three C's of Keats as distinct values or separate drives. I mean, in fact, they're not ideas at all. They're experiences that dance together like yin and yang. I mean, for example, curiosity creates connections from different scenes and enlivens creativity. And pain and suffering with others is often the genesis of great art and innovation from music, movies, and poetry to new societal and marketplace ideas. I mean, my idea for a movie was stirred by being curious about someone's suffering and the possibilities of relieving it. But I didn't do the idea or the resulting screenplay, the novel, the personal development book, or this program. There has never been an outline or plan for any of it. The universe did them through me and my writing partner. In fact, by being open and inviting the creative energy into our lives without questioning or trying to direct it, it triggered what the psychoanalyst Carl Jung called synchronicity. I mean, we experienced a fullness and presence which caused us to change and grow. And those changes brought us unexplainable insights and encounters with others that moved us to where we are today. It was and still is a transcendent experience filled with joy and grief, dynamism and frustration, Intense elation and severe confusion. I mean, it was a painful and exhilarating journey to a higher ground of being in connectedness. I'm not sure who said it, but it's certainly true in our case that the universe rewarded us for taking risks on its behalf. And so what exactly were those rewards? I mean, the screenplay still hasn't been made into a movie. Most people enjoy the books, but Oprah's people haven't come knocking on our door yet. I mean, what you'll discover when you go on this mysterious and paradoxical journey of exploration and creation is that rewards are not out there in the world. Creativity is not a skill to be leveraged. It's a unique essence inside of you to be set free. I mean, you don't create to get, you create to give your energy, your potential, your impact, yourself, to yourself and to the world. Creativity is about listening to and expressing your inner spirit in ways that bring fulfillment to your life while hopefully enriching the lives of others. In The Tropic of Cancer, Henry Miller wrote, I nevertheless found something I had not looked for, myself. I found that what I had desired all my life was not to live, if what others are doing is called living, but to express myself. In 2017, Dennis Esteman expressed himself. As a senior at Boca High in Boca Raton, Florida, a school with more than 3,000 students, Dennis looked around at fellow classmates in the busy lunchtime courtyard, and he felt something deep within his innermost awareness. He remembered how he never felt more lonely than his early days in school when he was afraid to socialize and join in on conversations, having recently immigrated from Haiti. It's not a good feeling, he said in an interview. 
You're by yourself. And that's something that I don't want anyone to go through. So, with some friends, Dennis started a club called We Dine Together. Their mission is to search the school's cafeteria and courtyard for students who are eating alone. And then over pizza or sack lunches, spend their lunch period with a different student every day, letting them know they have a friend. As Dennis explained, we want to get kids to come out of their comfort zones and realize that they have a lot in common, no matter where they're born, what their background is, or whether they speak with an accent. In one way or another, we're all alike. We Dine Together has grown from one curious, compassionate, and creative young man to chapters in dozens of schools across the United States. And with the simple intent to reach out and ensure that every student feels that he or she is seen and supported. That's creativity. Uniquely and bravely expressing your inner truth in making a difference in people's lives. Rebelling against the mundane scheme of things. Being the right person at the right time in finding inner peace in nothing more than the heartfelt process. You see, don't be confused. Creativity is not about fine art. You never have to write a word or paint a picture. Creativity is about human expression and animating other people's essences, their oneness with being. It's about going deep into what you feel and what you know and what you love your ideas and dreams, and then bringing them to life. Creativity is about having your eyes wide open to possibility, listening to your inner voice and making a contribution by expressing that essence. In the early 1960s, most scientists dismissed the idea of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth by the end of the decade. But President John F. Kennedy expressed his inner truth in a creative and meaningful way and moved the public and NASA employees to feel that truth and make it a reality. JFK's unique ability to connect people's lives and work to a bold aspiration is often recounted in a story of his first visit to NASA headquarters in 1961. While touring the facility, President Kennedy's entourage came upon a man mopping the floor in one of the hallways. So the president stopped to chat, shook his hand, and asked him what he did at NASA. The janitor proudly addressed the young president by saying, Sir, I'm helping to put a man on the moon. You don't have to hold a title to make a difference. We are all creative beings, and it's our unique lives that are our true art. In the movie Steve Jobs, Apple's co-founder, Steve Wozniak, played by Seth Rogen, he gets into a heated exchange with Jobs and says to him, you know, you can't write code, you're not an engineer, you're not a designer, you can't put a hammer to a nail. So how come 10 times a day I read Steve Jobs is a genius? What do you do? Look, what Steve Jobs did was release his creative spirit and change the world. I mean, he once said, when you ask creative people how they did something, they feel a little guilty because they didn't really do it. They just saw something. So creativity is about seeing something, stepping out of your script and living dangerously. It's about fighting past the voice of doubt and conformity that says, who do you think you are? You shouldn't be doing that and then doing it anyway. I mean, Steve Jobs dropped out of college and yet he helped steer the evolution of modern technology before succumbing to cancer at age 56. And we spend our days worrying about what now exactly? I mean, wasting time or money doing things that fully absorb our souls? 
and which may ultimately move the hearts and minds of others as well? Because why again? Because it may not pay off to live fully? The juice may not be worth the squeeze? It sounds absolutely ridiculous when you really think about it. Because moving hearts and minds is the juice of life and the essence of creativity. Because life is creativity. Life moves, changes, adapts, and transforms, and often in mysterious and paradoxical ways. I'll never forget this one time, way back in my high school days, one of my teachers was trying to get our class to understand that our beliefs about the world are invented, made up, you know, social constructions. We infuse words and concepts with meaning, which animates various stories in our heads. Now, I distinctly remember looking down at my desk, wondering what the hell he was talking about, and what had compelled me to choose that particular class. And then, without warning, BAM! I mean, I was jolted awake by the sound of a book slamming against a desk. I looked up and I watched as my crazed teacher walked towards the door, yanked it wide open, stepped into the long hallway, and at the top of his lung shouted, He then strolled back into the room, gently closed the door behind him, turned, and looked at us. <laughs> I found myself like slumped way down in my chair, I'm trying to become small and hide from, I mean, I really wasn't sure from what. And then I looked around the room and I discovered that everyone else was hiding too. We all felt embarrassed, ashamed, and we didn't even do anything. Our maniacal teacher then went on to point out how a simple utterance, now albeit a loud utterance, <laughs> had created such a profound effect on our feelings and behavior. And then the bell rang and class ended. I sat at my desk disturbed and perplexed and I watched as everyone else simply carried on and hustled out of the room. Finally, I picked up my books and I walked up to my teacher who was packing up his things and I asked, I mean I honestly can't remember what I asked him, but I do remember that he handed me a book. This book, I still have it, it's called The Book and it was written by Alan Watts. Here are Watts' opening lines. Just what should a young man or woman know in order to be in the know? Is there, in other words, some inside information, some special taboo, some real lowdown on life and existence that most parents and teachers either don't know or won't tell? And so began my lifelong journey into trying to understand our strange human condition to deepen my understanding of the key ideas that really matter in life and to eventually get to know myself. You see, those two creative risks, Alan Watts writing down his ideas in a book called The Book, and my wild-eyed teacher screaming a profanity at the top of his lungs, changed my life forever. And who knows, perhaps those influences and inspirations and our risks with the creation of I Am Keats in this program will change your life as well. So what's the secret of creativity? Are you ready? You have a pen and paper? Okay, get ready to write this down. There isn't one. Creativity can't be pinned down, opened up, and examined. It's alive. It's a happening, a dance between the human mind and the dynamic environment. It's also a dance within people's minds, between their intentions and memories their wandering imaginations, and their focused intellect. Of course, that reality is not going to stop people from trying to dissect the creative process and develop a model, right? So they can try to control it 
and judge it. We just think everyone would be better served by trying to figure out what prevents creativity. Because again, it's in all of us just waiting to be released. In fact, in the 1960s, a researcher named George Land conducted a study of hundreds of five-year-olds and found that 98% of them, of those children, scored in the highly creative range. Dr. Land retested each subject during five-year increments and found that as the children grew into adults, they effectively had the creativity trained out of them. In the words of Dr. Land, non-creative behavior is learned because we're conditioned to live according to a stifling script. It's that script, the single-minded focus on avoiding punishment or achieving some kind of reward that narrows our perspective and stops us from thinking deeply and seeing vast possibilities. Now, as an interesting aside, I once traveled with Dr. Land to give talks on cre creativity and innovation as a past recipient of the George Land Innovator of the Year Award. And my secret? At heart, I'm just a big kid. So little Emma is four years old, and her older brother, he's 13. So the older brother has some, you know, friends in his room, and they're listening to music and just cutting up, you know, punching each other in the arm, whatever they do. And little four-year-old Emma is walking back and forth in front of her brother's open door. She's peeking in. She wants to get her brother's attention and be invited in, but she's not going to just storm into that room, right? Okay, all of a sudden, the older brother, he sees Emma, and he says to his friends, Hey, guys, you have to see this. My little sister is so stupid. Watch this. He yells out, Emma, come here for a minute. Emma gets all excited, right? She jumps up and runs into the room, and she says, Yeah. And the older brother looks at his friends, and he winks, and he says, Watch how dumb this kid is. She does this every time. He reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a nickel and a dime and he thrusts them out in his open hand and says to Emma, Emma, which one do you want? The big one or the little one? And he turns and winks at his friends again. Emma reaches out, grabs the nickel, shoves it in her pocket and runs down to her room. These kids start laughing uncontrollably. Ah, your sister is so stupid. Okay. So unbeknownst to the kids, the children's father has been standing outside the room, you know, and he's been peeking, watching the whole thing. He shakes his head, rolls his eyes, and heads down to Emma's room. Take care of that thing first. And there's little Emma, bouncing on the bed. The father walks in and says, Hey, Emma, come here for a minute. Emma bounces over. Yeah, Dad, Emma, stop bouncing for a minute. Oh, okay, Dad, what is it? Emma, I was peeking in and I saw what happened in your brother's room. Emma says, yeah. He says, Em, you know the difference between a nickel and a dime, don't you? She says, well, yeah, Dad, a nickel is five pennies. And a dime is 10 pennies. Father says, that's right, honey. So when your brother asks you which one you want, the big one or the little one, why are you always taking the nickel? Emma jumps off the bed, reaches underneath, and pulls out a sock full of nickels. And she says, Daddy, when I take the dime, the game is over. Do you see? Little Emma is wise beyond her age. She doesn't care about status or being right. She cares about the relationship. She knows the reality is about connection and interaction. A wise rabbi once said, If I am I because you are you, and you are you because I am I, then I am not I and you are not you. Do you see? We are not separate. We define each other. We are fronts and backs of each other. 
In order to describe a particular person, who she is, you must describe her behavior, what she does. And to describe what she does, you must describe it in relationship to others and to the world. See, Emma is not separate. She's a creative force, the essence of the universe. She doesn't live in an isolated, self-important story. Sure, she has an ego. She's aware that she exists distinctly from others. Who isn't? But she also understands that like a thumb on a hand, she's connected to everything and everyone and not in control of any of it. And yet, you see, the game, the nickel and dime game and the exquisite game of life, it doesn't happen in the unique way that it does without Emma. Her contribution to the world is herself. It's like leaning two sticks against each other, right? They stand up because they support each other. Take one away and the other falls. Emma knows what she wants as well as other people's desires and perspectives. And she instinctively knows how to balance them. She's conscious, but not self-conscious. She doesn't need to be right or to prove herself to anyone. She simply wants to engage in the dance, have the dance go on, and have everyone be happy to improve the relationship. You see, she's pure energy dancing with other energy, interrelated and interdependent. And so are you. And so am I. And that awareness is the key to being curious, compassionate, and creative without worry or guilt. Because creativity is simply bringing the essence of the universe into the moments of your life. It's giving your inner gift to whatever is happening. And how can you possibly feel anxious about that intention, about that truth? Picasso once said, art is a lie that makes us realize truth. Art is a lie because it's a representation of reality. It's not actual reality. Picasso's most famous lie or creation, Guernica, about the bombing of a village in northern Spain, helped bring worldwide attention to the Spanish Civil War and is regarded as one of the most powerful anti-war paintings in history. That painting conveyed his truth about the tragedy. Think of all creativity the same way. It's bringing your truth, your innermost feelings and thoughts to life so that you can bring other people's feelings and thoughts to life so that they realize truth. It happens when an internal passion moves you to create and you feel compelled to share it with the world in hopes that it moves others as well. And it doesn't matter how you do it, whether through words, you know, waving your arms about, or with splashes of color. So here's a description of a crow from the results of a Google search. A large perching bird with mostly glossy black plumage, a heavy bill, and a raucous voice. And here's the inner expression of a crow by the poet Callum Poulsen. So beautiful, but often unseen, a maid of nature, the street cleaner that's everywhere, never thanked, never liked, always ignored, so elegant in a way no one sees. But without it, we would be in trash up to our knees. With the heart of a lion, the mind of a fox, the color of the night sky, a crow, the unpaid workman that helps in every way, each and every day. So which one helps you move closer to reality and see the truth of a crow? Because that's what we're after with this transformative process. The truth of existence, the reality of the amazing dynamism, interdependence, and unknowability of life. Truth is not a simple description of a bird or a tree or flower or even a human being. No, truth reveals what's concealed 
It's a conveyance of connectedness. It's not a reduction of reality to what is known. It's an expansion of reality to what is unknown, to what is possible, to otherness and relationship, to beauty and love. And creativity is what brings truth to life and makes it our reality. Take Treyer Scott, an award-winning photographer and author. What makes her creative is her use of those talents to bring life to her curious, compassionate spirit, especially her love of animals. In 2005, she was volunteering in a local shelter and felt the unbearable pain of caring for homeless dogs. Dogs that were suffering, she said, because of their breed, because there weren't enough homes for them, because they were left behind. She longed to use her photographic talent to do something that might help. And so she put all of her pain and soul into taking powerful close-ups of the dogs. Images that exuded the dog's unique character and that showed us what loving, intelligent, sensitive creatures these abandoned companions truly are. I mean, with her unique skills and through her poetic sensibility, she shared her heartfelt experiences with the world online and in her books. She wasn't trying to tell a story with her creations. She was trying to evoke an emotional response by making visible the beauty of the shelter dogs, a soulful essence that is concealed by their stark environments. And through her compassionate, creative act, Scott raised the awareness of shelter dogs and especially the need for more adoptive homes for these beautiful, abandoned creatures. You see, there's a big difference between facts and truth. Facts are beliefs and narratives that direct and control us, telling us what everything is and how everything works. Truth is faith and poetry, which calls up something inside of us, takes us someplace we don't ordinarily go, and reveals something we can't really grasp. You know, narrative tells us how to think and feel. It keeps you hypnotized in a prevailing story. Poetry knocks you out of your story and evokes the complexities and mysteries of life so that you can exercise free will and choose to think and act act differently, to go off script. You're not trying to figure anything out. You're being drawn into what's there to feel the pleading, soulful eyes of a shelter dog, to identify with her and then jump in your car and go bring her home. In his book, Story, the screenwriter, Robert McKee, explains the difference between truth and fact. He writes, what happens is fact, not truth. Truth is what we think about what happens. What we think about what happens, our perception and feelings of the world, is what drives our behavior. You see, I tried to get this idea across years ago in a TED Talk with this example. So the fact is that you and I are outgrowths of a huge living sphere which is rocketing through space faster than a bullet shot out of gun around another ball of fire. That is a scientific fact, but it's not your truth. If it was, if you really felt it, if you defined yourself as the world rather than a short-term passenger on it, it would profoundly change how you live your life. You see, a fact is like a static puzzle piece. You analyze it and you make useful predictions about it. It reduces the unknown to a comforting known for a while. The truth is an unsolvable shifting image. It's the amazing relationship between and among the dynamic pieces. And creativity is what brings that reality to life. Creativity, then, is a rebellion against the known, against reductionism and separateness, against the script. It exposes the true character of everything. It stirs you up, makes you uncomfortable, and makes you think. 
I mean, my TED Talk was titled, Why TED Talks Don't Change People's Behaviors. You see, my point was that information is not what moves people, no matter how expertly conveyed. And believe me, I know. I've been behind the curtain. TED Talks themselves, they're highly choreographed narratives. They're not designed to wake you up. They're designed to make you feel good and to spread online. See, what moves people is the unexpected. Distress, confusion, incitement, anything that disrupts the consensual hallucination of everyday life. My high school teacher could have told engaging stories and provided charts and graphs and countless examples. And the class may have eventually understood. Instead, it was his creative act of incitement which woke me up and caused me to see. Do you see? Life is not a fact-based, objective reality. It's a truth-based, subjective construct, one colored by an aggregation of personal experiences, and it's interpreted through an ever-shifting perceptual lens. And this reality includes great scientific advancements, you know, which also require an irrational incitement to move people, a luminous moment when an innovator does something radical to bring his or her truth to life. Let me give you an example. In 1981, Australian researcher Barry Marshall, he had such strong faith in his and fellow researcher Robin Warren's radical idea that bacteria, not stress, causes stomach ulcers, that he proved it to the disbelieving medical establishment by drinking a glass filled with hundreds of millions of H. pylori bacteria. Now, using an endoscope, his research team monitored the progression of the disease, the antibiotic treatment, and the eventual cure of Marshall's severe gastritis, moving his revolutionary idea forward in the world of gastrointestinal medicine. Years later, their world-changing idea would finally become common knowledge, a fact. And as a tribute to their conviction, their creativity and tenacity, both men were eventually awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine. Now, am I suggesting that you flat out condemn the current thinking? That you reject the facts, the science, the prevailing narrative because it doesn't fit your story? <laughs> Absolutely not. I'm saying that you should understand it and recognize its limitations. It is not immutable. The scientific reality of life is an empowering act of human ingenuity. It got us to where we are today. Truth doesn't negate that gift, nor its wonder. It expands it. It opens your mind to further possibility. You see, what I am saying is that knowledge is a commodity today. Everyone has access to it. To move people and change the world, you need the courage to expose the truth. Truth is shocking, not comforting. And so your true teachers are not facts or current orthodoxies. They're the people in situations you confront that incite a sense of discomfort in you. Instead of seeing them as threats, you should become curious about those feelings of aliveness and see them as catalysts for growth and expansion. Ask yourself, what you have to learn from those happenings. But again, and this is our overriding message with this program, you have to catch those opportunities and rebel against your scripted feelings. Otherwise, you'll remain a puppet pulled by the strings of your fearful hypnotic conditioning. Let me give you a personal example. So I was heading, I don't know, it was an event somewhere in the Midwest, and I was giving a closing keynote speech to a pretty big audience. I think it was around 4,000 people. And I was scheduled to be on stage at 3 in the afternoon. So I figured 
I could leave my home early that same morning, right? So the first leg of my flight arrived at 6.30 in the morning in Philadelphia, on time, and about an hour layover. So, you know, I was comfortable. I grabbed my briefcase, I strolled off the plane, and I stood quietly scanning the flight information display. I glanced at my ticket, but I could not find my flight anywhere on these displays. I mean, was I looking at the right display? Here we go, my pulse starts to race. So I looked harder, like that would make it appear. Nothing, what the hell's going on? I turned and I glanced at passersby, hoping that someone would clue me in, right? I'm getting all these blank stares. I began to sweat through my dress shirt and my suit jacket. Panic was setting in. I turned and I hurried. I went to the nearest flight information center and I stood in the short line that felt like it was miles long. My tension was growing and growing. When I finally stepped up to the counter, I encountered a zombie agent. I said to this person, I don't see my flight on the display. Just grabbed the ticket out of my hand. That's because it's been canceled. That was her deadpan response. Okay, I calmly replied. So when's the next flight? That's it for today. There are no more flights to that destination. <laughs> okay, I felt time stop, man. Blood was pulsing through the arteries in my neck. I leaned over the counter, and I, I mean directly towards the startled agent, right? What the hell do you mean that's it for today? All of a sudden, I felt a gentle hand on my shoulder, and I turned, and I caught the empathetic gaze of a, an elderly man of the cloth. What's wrong, my son, he asked. I was completely caught off guard. Um, my flight has been canceled, and I have to be somewhere, which was like pretty stupid, right? <laughs> Considering I was standing in an airport, I mean, everyone had to be somewhere. Anyway, he leaned towards me, and he gently said, I am sure everything will be fine. Yeah, I hope so, I responded, a whiff of sarcasm in my voice. So, he added with a sparkle in his eyes, do you know why when the Messiah returns, he is coming back on a donkey? Huh? No, why? Because the airlines are unreliable. He looked directly into my eyes and smiled. And I looked at him and I burst out laughing. I mean, as the great Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore once said, the burden of the self is lightened when I laugh at myself. The elderly man's enlightened humor totally knocked me out of my ridiculous hero story and my negative frame of mind. Now that's creativity. It's not about positive thinking. It's about triumphing over the status quo and the self-perpetuation of identity. Because of that inciting incident and my changed perspective, everything did, in fact, turn out fine. I mean, my mind was set free from my story, and my imagination was unleashed. With my lightened mood, which expands possibility, I coaxed and conjoled and secured a later flight on another airline. Yes, I'd be 30 minutes late to the venue, but I was swimming in possibility. So I hired a local comic to warm up the audience for me. So then I arrived at the venue just as he was receiving his applause. And even though I was literally dragged from my cab and thrown onto the stage, I ended up giving the best speech of my career, relaxed and authentic. And the audience sensed it and they loved it. And why did it all happen? that way? Because a little old man understood the meaning of life and he was brave enough to honor his inner voice and gift it to me in that holy moment. And at the same time, he was wise enough to laugh at the absurdity of it all. I mean, I guess creativity really is intelligence, having fun. Viktor Frankl said, the meaning of life differs from man to man, from day to day, and from hour to hour. What matters, therefore, is not the meaning of life in general, but rather the specific meaning of a person's life at a given moment. 
A complete stranger made that given moment in a busy airport a transcendent one for me, taking me out of my anxious mind movie and helping me relax in the chaos of a supposedly unmanageable moment. And by moving me to let go of control, I got the control I was looking for all along, a creative dance with the universe. And that spirited dance spilled into an audience of thousands. Leonardo da Vinci said, an artist does not understand anything until he can do it. That's the same sentiment expressed by John Keats when he wrote, nothing ever becomes real till it is experienced. You can't learn to be creative by reading about it or taking a class, including this program, because creativity is not about knowledge. It's about courage. You have to let go and dance with the tension of taking a leap of faith into the moment without a comforting script. That's called improv. I mean, in improvisational theater, the characters, the dialogue and action are created collaboratively in real time. In one scene, you may be a lost child. And in the next, a self-important speaker whose flight has been canceled. I mean, most actors hate improv because they fear the lack of control and the effort required to be fully present and attentive. I mean, improv takes guts. Improv is creation on the fly during the actual performance. There's no script or director, and so you have to perform without a net, stripped of the comfort of your character. Those skilled at improv, they relish the spontaneity you know, the chance interactions and experiences. To them, it's a relief. Since realizing that it has no idea where the scene is going, their frenetic Coleridge minds give up and surrender to Keats. And then their Keats and Coleridge minds work together in harmony. A suspension of thought, a contemplative awareness, and an attentive state of mind that combines to create scene enhancing dialogue and action. I mean, during improv, there's a, a receptive openness, an unscripted and unselfconscious acceptance of what is. Whatever happens, happens. You don't analyze it, judge it, or interfere with it. You accept the full scale experience for what it is in the moment. And look, acceptance doesn't mean resignation to what's happening, right? If you're practicing improv in your day-to-day, -day, you're not being a passive observer. Instead, you exude a no-bullshit vitality and a humble awareness of yourself and of the situation. I mean, like Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat in the colored section of the bus to a white passenger after the whites-only section was filled. Or Jesus casting the money changers out of the temple or four foot, 10 inch tall Mother Teresa, who left her home at the age of 18 to follow her inner voice, and 50 years later was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, she was creativity and passion personified. One time she was on a flight to Mexico City. When her lunch came, she asked how much it cost. Around a dollar, replied the puzzled flight attendant. Mother Teresa says, if I give you the meal back, will you give me the money for the poor? Okay, the attendant checked and she agreed to Mother's request. Well, witnessing what had happened, the others near her gave up their meals in exchange for the money for Mother Teresa to give to the poor. And that sentiment spread to every single person on that plane. I mean, were you going to eat? But that was not really enough, not for Mother Teresa, because as the plane was landing, right, and with everyone's meal money already in her pocket, she asked for something else. She wanted the foregone meals as well for the poor, and she got them. <laughs> There's an old Hasidic saying, the man who has confidence in himself gains the confidence of others. 
And that's true, but only if he's willing to express that confidence with boldness, with passion. That's what acceptance is all about. It means being situationally aware, both internally and externally. Right? I mean, you know what's going on, what you are doing, and you use your unique energy to move in the direction that Keats tells you to move with alert interest and with resolve. You deal with the situation and then build off of it. You're authentic and effective. Do you see Coleridge? He's an integral part of this creative process. It's Keats and Coleridge. They're in it together. Keats is... Imagination, the invisible world of possibility, free from the chains of conventional thinking. Inspiration, passion. Coleridge, he's reality. Memories, experience, the visible established ways of the world, reason and skill. So yes, reason and skill are necessary, but they are not the source of true creativity and personal greatness. They simply polish the gem. <laughs> I mean, the legendary record producer, Quincy Jones, he described the Beatles as, quote, the worst musicians in the world, unquote. I mean, he said that Paul McCartney was the worst bass player he had ever heard. And Ringo Starr, he said, don't even talk about it. <laughs> but together, the Beatles brought their personal truths alive in a way that touched millions and inspired musicians worldwide. Even Einstein supposedly said he never came upon any of his discoveries through the process of rational thinking. He connected with his inner essence, his intellectual instinct. But his rational mind helped him bring that wisdom of the universe into the world. I mean, great musical composers, they feel their melodies in their inner spirits. But in order to convey it to others, they must use their technical knowledge to write down the notes, the ones that they hear in their heads. So Coleridge is quite useful, right? You don't want to get rid of him permanently. Being a director, he knows how things work. He helps give form to your creative impulses. He's a resource to serve the creation, something greater than himself. I gotta tell you, if you've ever been on the set of a movie, it would amaze you how the director rapidly answers so many questions from so many people and with such confidence. To be creative is to use that knowledge and then to put Coleridge in his place. Don't let him take control. You see, Coleridge thinks he knows everything, but his imagination is limited to his past experiences, to his story. So creativity is to move from Keats to Coleridge and back again, to move from the mysteries of heaven to the answers of earth without letting that narrow perspective called reality lure you back in with its enchanting song of significance and its promise of certainty and comfort. Again, being creative is not about reducing the unknown to the known. It's about understanding the illusions of the world and making them your dance partners. So remember, you are not a character in a story defined by an imaginary past. You are not the victim of your history. You are the master of your destiny. You are pure energy in an interdependent dance with other energy. And you are not alone. So let's dance.